Hello everyone, welcome to Out in Tulava, where we're walking our way through the Lord of the Rings a chapter at a time, at least we were, till Tom showed up. He ruined it all, which funnily enough is what some people actually think about Tom. But that's the great part. There's so much to see when it comes to Tom. So this is part two of chapter seven, The House of Tom Bombadil. This video is basically all about Tom, Frodo, and their interactions, and the ring. See last week's video over here for a full chapter recap, and to hear about the other topics we talked about. Frodo's poem to Goldberry, Frodo's other reactions to meeting Goldberry, and the Hobbit's dreams. So let's dive in. Fastest chapter recap ever, go. Hobbits get to Tom's house, have a bath and dinner, go to sleep, have dreams, eat some more, talk with Tom all day, get some answers, get some information that gives them, the readers, more questions, gets directions from Tom on where to travel, next day and go to bed. Now that we're all caught up, let's start with a quick one. Before bed that first night, Frodo asked Tom if he heard them calling for help in the old forest. He says, did you hear me calling master? Or was it just chance that brought you at that moment? Love seeing the word chance, always a good time. I'll give bits of Tom's response here, including his verse, though we don't have time to go into detail about the verse and all of the things that it, that it means and hints at. Did I hear you calling? Nay, I did not hear, I was busy singing. Just chance brought me then, if chance you'd call it. It was no plan of mine, though I was waiting for you. We heard news of you and learned that you were wandering. I had an errand there, gathering water lilies, green leaves and lilies, white to prease my pretty lady. The last ere the year's end to keep them from the winter, to flower by her pretty feet till the snows are melted. Each year at summer's end, I go to find them for her, in a wide pool, deep and clear, far down with the window. There they open first in spring, and there they linger latest. By that pool long ago, I found the river daughter, fair young Goldberry sitting in the rushes. Sweet was her singing then, and her heart was beating. And that proved well for you, for now I shall no longer go down deep again along the forest water, not while the year is old. Nor shall I be passing old man Willow's house this side of springtime, not till the merry spring, when the river daughter dances down the withy path to bathe in the water. Now, while the verse is amazing and explains a lot of what was going on, I want to point out what Tom says. He says he was down by the willow by chance, if chance you call it. And it was no plan of his. Of course, this makes me think of fate, but also makes me think back to the Hobbit. Bilbo had an extraordinary amount of luck, and Elrond will echo this sentiment later in the council by saying those in the council were called, though he did not call them. He doesn't say chance, but you get what I'm saying. This is very clearly the working of the Valar, possibly even Eru, to bring about the end of Sauron. It's a little ambiguous, but also, like, not, not really. Next, let's talk about how most of their day was spent listening to Tom tell stories. There's a long paragraph about the stories Tom tells about the old forest. Of course, the prose is really just too good to not have at least go over a little bit of it. Tom's words laid bare the hearts of trees and their thoughts, which were often dark and strange and filled with the hatred of things that go free upon the earth, gnawing, biting, breaking, hacking, burning, destroyers and usurpers. It was not called the old forest without reason, for it was indeed ancient, survivor of vast forgotten woods, and in it there lived yet, aging no quicker than the hills, the fathers of the fathers of trees, remembering times when they were lords, the countless years had filled them with pride and rooted wisdom and with malice, but none were more dangerous than the Great Willow. This is obviously pertinent to the hobbits since they just came through the old forest, not to mention old men willow, and it helps them understand what happened to them. I'm, well, let's just say I'm no counselor, but I'm pretty sure understanding can be like a pretty good thing when you're dealing with trauma. Any counselors out there, you can check me on that too. Feel free. Tom then works his way into the stories about the great barrows. We get this amazing picture of time passing and battles being fought. Green walls and white walls rose. There were fortresses on the heights. Kings of little kingdoms fought together. And the young sun shone like fire on the red metal of their new and greedy swords. There was victory and defeat. And towers fell, fortresses were burned, and flames went up into the sky. Gold was piled on the beers of dead kings and queens and mounds covered them and the stone doors were shut and the grass grew over all. Now, I don't think I'm 100% correct here, but I kind of like to think he's just talking about the early third age uh, with battles, you know, Arthodyne, Cardolan, and Angmar and Rudar, don't forget Rudar, and giving the hobbits a little history lesson about how the barrows kind of came to be. Though again, I think that came earlier. Not exactly comforting information, but maybe it gives them a proper respect and understanding of what they will be passing by the next day and help them out. 
maybe help them out. And then the hobbits kind of pick back up to hearing Tom now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory and beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider and the seas flowed straight to the western shore and still on and back Tom went singing out into ancient starlight when only the elf sires were awake, enchanted, and it seemed as if under the spell of his words, the wind had gone and the clouds had dried up and the day had been withdrawn and darkness had come from east and west and all the sky was filled with the light of white stars. And here we have, I believe, our first glimpse of the epic history that Tolkien started working on around 1914 or so. Over 40 years passed before his audience read this passage. Of course, Tom is talking about the past ages of Middle-earth. He's even talking about pre-First Age stuff, the Valiant Years when the Elves awoke in Cuyvenon. That was over 11,000 years ago. The timeline starts to get kind of fussy and valiant, fuzzy rather, in Valiant Years because thanks to Carl Hotstetter and the nature of Middle-earth, we learned Tolkien was working on adjusting his timeline. And while the math isn't exactly like fuzzy, I still don't totally understand it, so I'll call it fuzzy. Basically, yeah, well over 11,000 years ago. Ridiculous, but this is Tolkien putting in what the Prancing Pony podcast guys like to call textual ruins. There's hints of greater things, bigger histories behind what they're saying. It makes me laugh to think that it's kind of Tolkien doing like a little guerrilla marketing to get readers to write Alan and Unwin to like get more about those stories that Tom told, which honestly, I wouldn't put it past him at all. Now that we know Tom is pretty much tens of thousands of years old, really starts to beg the question, who is Tom Bombadil? First, let's look at Goldberry's response to Frodo asking the question. Fair lady, said Frodo again after a while. Tell me, if my asking does not seem foolish, who is Tom Bombadil? He is, said Goldberry, staying her swift movements and smiling. Frodo looked at her questioningly. He is as you have seen him, she said in answer to his look. He is the master of wood, water, and hill. Then all this strange land belongs to him? No, indeed, she answered, and her smile faded. That would indeed be a burden. She added in a low voice, as if to herself, the trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land belong each to themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the hilltops under light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. All right, so what do we learn from Goldberry? Tom Bombadil is master. Neat. But as some have pointed out, that because she uses the phrase, he is. It's a signal to readers that, you know, he's Eru Iluvatar because the Bible, God calls himself, I am. We all know Tolkien was a devout Catholic, but that doesn't quite sit right with me, especially after hearing what is said about Tom in the Council of Elrond, which I'm not gonna go into detail here. So what does Tom say in response to, you know, Frodo asking who he is? Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you alone, yourself and nameless? Well, you are young and I am old. Elvis, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friends, Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless before the dark lord came from outside. Side note, if you remember from this video here in chapter six, we went through a little history of where Tom came from uh, literarily, and when he first kind of appeared in writing. I stated Tolkien probably doesn't even actually know what Tom is, and I'm still kind of sticking to that, but it's a fun mental exercise to kind of try and figure out like what he is anyway. Okay, let's break it down and maybe we can kind of figure out what he is. In Tom's response, he basically says he saw everything come into being. Saw the first raindrops, saw the elves pass westward from Quirivian into Beleriand and beyond. He even survived the Akalabeth, the fall of Numenor. Okay, so now we need to know more about how the world is created. Um, so, okay, short version. This could probably be a dumbed down version just so I can understand it. Eru Iluvatar and the Einar made music together before anything was created. This music basically wrote the history of Middle-earth. The themes created by Eru and the Harmony, including Discord, all had consequences in the history that was to come. Eru showed the Einar the vision of what the music created and they saw the elves created by Eru in the third theme, but Eru alone had anything to do with the elves. Sliding thousands of years forward, we see Aule created the dwarves and is reprimanded by Eru because they are basically automatons, because Aule doesn't have the power to create perfectly like actual sentient be beings, you know, like the elves or men. This, of course, eventually brought Tolkien grief when he started truly trying to figure out the origins of orcs, but that's an entirely different <laughs> discussion. 
And in this section of the Ainulindale and in the Silmarillion, it does talk about the elves and men being created, but it doesn't talk about every single thing the Ainur created with their music. I mean, we have other sentient beings like Ents, I guess, right? So I think Eru let the music create other beings and he gave those beings agency. Thus, the conclusion. Tom Bombadil, like the mountain Karathras, is a genius loci. Basically, he's the embodiment of the spirit of the land, the specific area of the land in particular. I think the music of the Einar gave birth to creatures such as these, or spirits, and Eru decided to give them a self. Not a soul, exactly, but a self. Agency. So, in a nutshell, that's what I think Tom is. I'd love to hear comments what you think. Is there a hole in my logic and kind of in my reasoning? Please let me know. Love to discuss it with you. But now that we know who know who Tom is, we can assume that is why the ring didn't make him invisible? Or why was he, you know, like, why could he still see Frodo when he had the ring on? If he's, you know, super powerful genius loci, wouldn't he be like above the ring in power anyway? Well, at one, I'd say no, the Einar would have created the genius loci with their music. While he's almost, you know, ultimate power within his bounds, if a Maya can fall to the ring, then he must be able to if we base it just kind of on sheer power. Well, thanks to Reddit user Patterson Jeff A for giving me the rough location, and then Tony Mead for his amazing summaries of exploring Lord of the Rings streams. We can reference episode 175 for our answer. And if we remember back to talking about the ring and how Bilbo's tenure as the ring bearer is influenced by his decisions while using the ring. He pitied Gollum and didn't kill him. He basically just seemed to want to have a good time in life, so the ring didn't really corrupt him. Then Hobbit just kind of helped him hide, you know, from the Sackville Bagginses. So the ring exaggerates and plays on the desires of the person's holding it. Well, Tom desires nothing he doesn't already have. He's content. As Tony worded it in his summary on the Signum forums, which I'll link below, Tom's contentment and joy in the moment make him immune to the temptations of the ring, as there would be nothing which it could tempt Tom with, as it plays on one's unfulfilled desires. That's amazingly summarized, Tony. Thank you. Okay, so Tom is epic and the ring doesn't affect him. Why did Frodo put the ring on and try to creep out of the house? That's good question, viewer. Thank you for asking. Here's the answer. I don't know. I, I think the best I can do is say it was the ring's influence as to why he did it. Whatever sentience the ring has uh, or obtained, I guess, from Sauron in the making did not want to be around someone. It was unable to tempt. I kind of see the ring as like this, you know, like ultimate manipulator. It's like to its proverbial bones. It's always looking for the next mark to manipulate and get something from. Always looking to see if they can find someone who can get them further than the current person they're with. The ring at this moment realizes, I know I'm personifying, but it realizes it's maxed out its manipulation potential and it can't get a more powerful being to take it, like other than Frodo, and use it to their destruction. So it, it bounces. Or rather, it gets Frodo to, to try and bounce. But luckily, Tom calls him out, brings him back in. Of course, you might still be wondering, why are the hobbits here? Like, why are they spending a couple of nights at, like, at this house owned by some weird singing dude with bright clothes, and, like a river nymph for a wife? And the best answer I can give you is right here, okay? Again, I don't know. I haven't finished all the history of Middle Earth or anything, so there's still a lot for me to learn, I guess, but I can make a couple of random guesses. One, they're here accidentally. The version of the Lord of the Rings we have now is ridiculously different from what the professor initially wrote. But he did kind of discover the story as it went along. Faramir was essentially an accident. So maybe he was writing about the old forest and along comes Tom kind of out of his memory because he wrote the adventures of Tom Bombadil long ago and took place in the same area in Middle Earth. Two, it's a simple plot device. So we'll see next week, barring a long video, having to split into two here, the hobbits get their daggers from the Barrow Downs. And as they were created to fight Angmar and their Witch King long ago, that is what helps Mary and Eowyn defeat him later. I mean, it's pretty darn convenient. Or three, combination of textual ruin world building. It gives Tolkien a chance to talk about the First Age a little bit and explore the world. Elrond says later in the Council chapter that the Old Forest used to be much bigger and a squirrel could travel from Dunlin to Shire or something like that. So world building textual ruins. All three reasons are probably why we take this little stop at Tom's house. But I hope you see that there was a lot we learned about the story, things, things to come, the nature of Middle Earth and its inhabitants, and even a little bit of whimsy, which is great. Maybe not every single page has to progress the plot forward, right? Maybe just the characters can develop a little. We can learn more about them. And here we learned more about Frodo and the Ring 
to help kind of inform our reading moving forward. At least I did. So, you know, so there's that. Whew. And that's the House of Tom Bombadil. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know in the comments below if you agree with my conclusions here and feel free to poke holes in them. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Love hearing different viewpoints. Until next time, out in Tulava, day shall come again. Mm -hmm.